Okay, so here, one of the big reasons I want to show this one to you, here is where, and can you pass those? We take a look at this document this, that I have printed for you that is also available online and is also available in the folders that came from the pen drives. To find it in the folders on the pen drives, to see the digital copy, it's inside the georeferencing calculator folder. And it's called the Georeferencing Quick Reference Guide. So it looks like this. Did they, everyone get one yet? Yes. Yes? Okay. Okay, so the printed copy is because when you're georeferencing, having that in your hand is much more useful than having the digital copy. You can flip around quickly, find what you're looking for, maybe even draw notes and pictures on that piece of paper as you learn things. The quick reference guide is meant to be only a document that long that encapsulates all of the recommendations about how to georeference localities instead of having to read the 100 page book. This reduces it to one, in this case, PDF document. So one of the nice things about the guide, aside from being short, is that it defines all the terms that you need to know right at the beginning of the document. So we've been through all of these already. You can see that they're all Darwin core terms. So it's describing them for you again in this place. All of them, they're all Darwin core terms. Then the second section of the document <coughs> describes how to use the georeferencing calculator in combination with this quick referencing guide. So it's saying on the calculator you make calculation types by this, locality types by this. It's describing the parts of the calculator and how to use them in relation to this document. And finally it gives various references to where all of this information came from. It originally came from the website that was used by Manus and later by Herpnet and Ornus, which turned into this paper published in the International Journal of Geographical Information Science and also turned into this book and then was later elaborated in other ways. So <coughs> the guide there is an encapsulation with a very long history of use back to 2001. Within the document, you basically have two columns. One describes the locality type. It's trying to make categories. And each cell and row is one particular kind of a locality. All the cells in this column that share the same color are in the same category. So if you look on your sheets, there, this one is called named place, this one is called named place, and so on. There are many of them. And then within it, within named place, this is a specific kind. It's a named place that consists of a bounded area. And that one's a named place that consists of an undefined area. We don't know where the boundaries are. And then on the right is a description of how to georeference that with the georeferencing calculator. It's a recipe. It says, for calculation type, choose this. For locality type, choose that. To get the coordinates, do this. To get the extent, do this. Just a recipe. Following that recipe, you just put what you need to in the georeferencing calculator hit georeference, out comes the answer. It's meant to be as easy as that. Once you're able to distinguish one type from another, which is why I want to leave you with 
some information about what these locality types are. So the presentation, which is also in your folder, is a complement to this document because this document has no pictures. The PowerPoint presentation has pictures showing examples of many of these different locality types. So I'll show you what that looks like now. So that's the relationship between the PowerPoint and that piece of paper, which should be sitting beside your desk whenever you're georeferencing. Named places are those that refer to any kind of geographical feature that you might find in a gazetteer or a list of names and coordinates. So it consists of towns and cities and mountains and all kinds of different things. Things with names and coordinates. So the PowerPoint presentation describes the concept of a linear extent for named places and it's always the distance from the geographic center Here's an example of the location to the furthest point of the geographic extent of the location. So as I was going around helping you to do the georeference, this is information that you didn't already have. If you had learned this already, you wouldn't have had to struggle. But if you hadn't had to struggle, I wouldn't have been able to show you how hard it is to write a good locality. So I hope you forgive me by giving you the, the way to do it now. So, always for named places, basically what you want to do is find the geographic center. Here's my named place. It has a nice border around it in Google Maps. Find the center, and I measure the distance to the farthest point away from that center. And that's my linear extent. So now we get into specific examples of named places, like a small town. A small town is one of those examples of a bound, an unbounded named place. If we look on the map, we see some water tanks or water storage here. This is a prison. These are some buildings and some houses. That's a gravel pit. All these things are associated with this name, Gene, on the map. There's the word Gene. They're all related to it, but we don't know the boundaries. If I live in Gene, and my house is right here, do the people in Gene think that I'm an outsider? Or do they say, yes, I live in Gene also? I don't know the answer. That's what I mean by it being unbounded. There's no lines on this map that say Gene starts and stops here. So in such a case, what I want to do is I want to create an extent that is conservative. It's the distance from the center. The name Gene is there, so that's the center of Gene. To the border of the name place farthest from the center. So what I do here is I look and I try to find any signs of civilization on the map. It turns out that the little dots there and the prison there and something over here, some buildings there, all those are human occupation. So I'm going to include all of those because beyond that, there's nothing. And I will call that gene. So that's the furthest extent from the center, is the furthest place where I find something that's human habitation. That's distinct from an urban area where we have plenty of maps that show what the boundaries are. This is a map for Johannesburg, and you'll find maps online that distinguish exactly where the boundaries of that are, at least where they are today. So now, what I'll do is I'll try to find the extent of Johannesburg by drawing a box around the polygon. The northernmost point, the easternmost point, westernmost point, and southernmost point to make my box. Then, I use the center of my box, right there, to be the center of Johannesburg. It's not the political center, it's the geographic center of the extremes. That's where I put my point. And then, as using the general rule for georeferencing and extents, my extent will be the distance from there 
to the farthest point in the polygon. It's not here, it's not here, it's actually way up here. That's the farthest I can get from Johannesburg and still be in my box. Okay, so I use that as my extent. Then we go to the opposite extreme, something like a street address. In this case, the street address is defined by the plot of land that is owned by that person, and it's very small, and we want to do the same sort of thing. Draw the polygon, find the center, and make the arrow go to the farthest distance. You see the pattern. You want to keep doing the same thing. Getting smaller still is a junction. So here we're at the junction of some road, the two roads, Sorry. Yeah, it's two roads. The Calvina road, Calvinia Road and the Sutherland Road. It's this junction between those two roads here. It's where they come together. So that's very specific, very small. And the center is just where they come together and the extent is just all the parts where they're both in the intersection. So that's a very, very good reference point for a georeference, a junction and farms, and forest reserves, and so on. They keep being the same, the same basic rules. Here, there's a slight distinction. You remember earlier I talked about point radius method in rivers, that the point radius doesn't represent the river very well, because the river is really right here. And the point radius includes all of these things that aren't river, all of that and all of that. Not only that, if I try to find the center of the river that's, the part of the river that's relevant to me, the center might be not in the river. So that's a point of concern. So what do we do? This is an example where we have a reference to a river, but it's also within a province. This stands for KwaZulu-Natal. So Here's the border of that province, right here, and there's the river. And so what I'm looking for is the place where all of those things are true at the same time, which is inside the province, this part of the river right here. That's why my circle is drawn around that. And what I've done to try to figure out the georeference is to take the extremes, the furthest disparate uh, points in the, the river, that are inside the province, here and there, and draw a line between them. 